Let me know when you want me to. All righty. All right, everybody, thanks for coming. Um, our next presentation, we have two speakers. We have Eric Swisher. Eric has more than 20 years of professional experience in air quality consulting fields and serves as a senior technical lead for all fours uh, continuous monitoring systems practice area responsibility for implementing strategic monitoring programs, training audits and ongoing compliance support. Uh, Greg Bancheri graduated from Westminster College with a double major in biology and environmental chemistry. His first job was an analytical chemist for the Apollonia engineers working hazardous waste remediation projects, performing chemical analysis on soils, process fluids, ambient air and industrial hygiene. Upon leaving the lab, he worked four years as a source tester for uh, Bayes uh, Converse Murdoch before joining Cascade Associates, a process and environmental monitoring instrument distributor. Uh, in 1990, he uh, formed Control Analytics. Uh, which he's owned until this last year when they were acquired by ESC Spectrum. Control Analytics is an analyzer engineering system integration and analyzer sales company specializing in online process and environmental analytical systems. Uh, he lives in the Pittsburgh area and his hobbies include golf, cycling, and uh, gas powered, human powered variety. Thank you. All right, I'll get us started off here. Uh, see if we can advance the slides with <clears throat> what we're experiencing now because I want to get through these a couple real quick because Greg has a lot of the meat and the potatoes of this presentation with respect to where we are now and how rapidly it's changing and we're going to be talking about we have systems we have to put monitoring systems in place we have deadlines compliance deadlines to get there when to where should we be and when how has that been changing uh, not just from a, a lag but to, from a timeline perspective but also from you know impact from a, a cost perspective because things have changed and things will change tomorrow so it's like this thing is evolving uh you know ever so quickly we're hoping it's going to get back to where we can get a little bit more certainty around it but right now we're just dealing in this uh, uh you know in a world of uncertainty and then to wrap up what we're going to do as greg goes through and kind of like what he's seeing as he goes through and does his integration projects we are going to then wrap up from a regulatory perspective on what are your options if you can't get what you need by the time in which you should have that, right? And what can you do and how can you actually uh, go through and, uh, uh, you know, hopefully be able to, to alleviate some of those compliance, to, you know, deadlines. So right here, just kind of a timeline and you can see like we're out in that 2020, you know, three, the July's of, ne of next year, that's, you know, compliance dates, right? So we've got to be in a certain start of action of installing procuring if not building right and all of those things require us getting some stuff and uh, that's what greg's going to be talking about is not what that project timeline looks like and then how procuring that stuff has changed and what you can be expecting um, as of the last couple weeks but again like i mentioned it um, you know uh, you know it's subject to change so with that Greg, if you want to go ahead and just take it from here and go through some of the you know, typical project, what it looks like and the impacts that we're seeing, and then we'll circle back at the end and wrap up with hopefully some options from a regulatory perspective. You find yourself uh, in a pinch. Morning. So I'm going to speak from really from the perspective of a system integrator, project management, system integration type uh, approach to a project. Most of what we do in this world requires some sort of system integration, some sort of overall project management, and uh, it starts with you, um, the end user, but it ends up, you know, at a, at a, in the hands of a compliance test team and EPA. And um, so what I wanted to do is just show what does a typical project timeline look like um, from the standpoint of, you know, from inception, when you're actually getting your spec prepared and you're, you're getting ready to go out to bid, you, you have that spec preparation through, uh, you know, cutting the or getting the um, RFQs out for integrators to look at. Uh, there's a, a period of time that the estimate needs to be completed and and uh, that you get that estimate back. You review it, and you cut a PO uh, and then you end up with a kickoff meeting and uh, you've chosen an integrator and you're really just getting started. And that can be anywhere from five to 15 weeks. But depending upon how quickly you had your spec prepared when you were ready to go. 
once an integrator has it in his hand, he's done a, a kickoff meeting with the client, they, they really enter the detailed engineering phase. And, you know, most of what we do is custom type engineering. You know, you've got to, you've got to look at the uh, approved manufacturers list. You've got to go through your specifications, produce approval drawings. And there's a lot that gets done in that engineering phase um, before you actually get your drawings and you approve them and, and issue them as you know, ready for construction. That can be anywhere from two to three months, depending upon the complexity of the project. Um, once an integrator is given approval for certain items, he starts buying them. Maybe they're shelters, they could be analyzers, they could be components for sample systems. And so there's a purchasing through re receiving phase. We're going to talk a lot about that um, because that's where we're seeing some real delays. Uh, and that can be anywhere from one to three months, again, depending upon the complexity of the equipment. Um, the types of materials that you're purchasing. Once a integrator has his gear in hand, uh, he can start constructing your system. And again, depends on, you know, timelines depend on whether it's a simple cabinet or enclosure system or whether it's a shelter, whether it's general purpose, hazardous area. Um, so there's a, there's a period of time that it takes to build that. And that's generally anywhere from one to three months. You go through a QAQC period, which is not somewhere you ever want to cut corners and that's one to two weeks where the integrator is testing the equipment not it's not an fat this is point to point wiring checks initial gas calibrations things like that and that's usually a couple of weeks solid of uh, of work on the system you do a factory acceptance test and usually that's witnessed by the client and that that generally takes a week um you, you, you develop a punch list you want to clear all that up before you ship at the site and then the actual shipment to site. So, so that phase where you're actually constructing, QAQCing the system and, and getting it to site can be anywhere from three to five months. Again, depending upon the complexity of the system. And then now it's in your hands, you want to install it. Um, depends how efficient you are in installing it, whether you got out in front for the installation. Uh, there's a startup period where the integrator, maybe some manufacturers come on site and then you have your certification, bringing your RATA test team in if, if it's a certified type system. And so, you know, you're looking at one to three months for that. So um, I did a quick, you know, uh, depiction of a timeline. This, this isn't uh, MS projects or anything, just a spreadsheet. But what I wanted to show you here is that there are some things that overlap. So you don't add all those. And that's where you can really gain some traction and really uh, shrink your timeline, applying those efficiencies where you can get more than one thing done at a time. But pre-COVID, it was, you could really expect the shortest implementation from the specification phase where you're developing your RFQ to when you would have your system certified. Somewhere between 30 and 35 weeks was about as short as anyone could employ, you know, actually implement a system, uh, a monitoring system. Uh, the longest, some of our flare systems, you know, were well over a year in, in, in total implementation time, some of them longer than that, but, but normally that's what you could expect. And I would say in a real world pre COVID, the average was probably between 40 and 45 weeks, just under a year to implement, um, a shelter based, uh, monitoring system, class one div two type project. So what's changed? Well, there's been massive supply chain disruptions from COVID. Um, most parts of materials are taking a lot longer to manufacture, taking longer to transport, taking longer for us to receive them at our facilities. Some components are exceedingly long. These uh, typically things like exotic metals, if you're doing something in Hastelloy or Monel, uh, you can see ridiculous lead times. Um, one component can hold up an entire subassembly. And if I don't have everything I need to build a sample system, I can have one or two components that literally stop that sample system construction from finishing. Electronic components coming out of Asia, chips, chip based components uh, are really creating some havoc right now. You, you, you see it in the automobile industry. Well, guess what? We're seeing it in PLC cards and other things. Um, and some of these disrupt disruptions are sporadic. In other words, you'll get a quote from a vendor that'll say, I can get you this in four weeks. We run a shortage report a week before we're ready to build that 
that subassembly and we contact the vendor and he says, oh, I'm not going to have it. It looks like for another two months and it completely disrupts the your flow of uh, of construction. And then, of course, manpower shortages where I think everybody's experiencing issues with with having the right bandwidth, the right people, everybody from the end user um, all the way to your 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 test teams. Here are some examples of current lead times for some of the hardware that we see out there that now this presentation, I was thinking flares and SEMS, but this is also very true for process analytical systems, uh, whether it's a, you know, a, a simulated distillation or, or micro distillation system in a refinery or other kinds of uh, process analytics. Um, GCs right now, ABB and Siemens are both at about 32 week delivery for gas chromatography equipment. ABB used to deliver in about 16 weeks and because of COVID they're, they're double that. Siemens has actually had a lot of problems over the last year and a half, two years because they moved a facility. And so they've actually shortened their deliveries, but these are much longer than what we used to expect from a GC and, you know, getting a gas uh, process gas chromatograph in about 16 weeks. Uh, the PGC 1000s, which are the small natural gas GCs that ABB makes in Oklahoma, uh, the total flow units, they used to get out to us in about eight weeks. Uh, these are now at, at 20 week delivery times. Yokogawa, Rosemount are telling us that they're about 20, 20 weeks up from about 18. So that, that hasn't changed much. Um, mass spectrometers, Extrel and Thermo are both sort of holding um, a fairly decent delivery, 10 to 12 weeks, 12 to 14 weeks. Uh, and um, we haven't purchased any thermos recently, but I can tell you that Extrel is, is hitting those delivery times. Uh, COSA, if you're into the calorimeters, COSA's stocked some units, so they've actually gotten out in front of this. Uh, they're telling us now you're, you're at about six week delivery for a COSA calorimeter. Now, if you're doing a flare system and you wanna measure hydrogen, you can add a hydrogen monitor to a calorimeter. Um, and if you're going to do that, that extends your delivery time. COSA didn't tell me how much longer a hydrogen monitor would take on that system, but uh, Hobre did. And the Hobre calorimeters are at about 20 weeks right now, which is longer than we're, we're used to from Hobre. And if you want hydrogen on that calorimeter, you're looking at at least another three weeks. Flare flows. Um, uh, you know, you're anywhere from from 12 to 16 weeks, whether OSI or sick, and, you know, the various flare flow, flow monitors. I did not get a number from Panometrics. Um, SEM components. It's interesting that a lot of the SEM components don't seem to be as badly affected as some of the other process analytical stuff, the, the GCs in particular. But Teledyne and Thermo are both in the 10 to 14 week period of time to get um, boxes. Um, uh, Teledyne's got a new series, the N series on the market right now, and uh, they're, they, they were a little bit longer getting that N series out to the, to the clients, but I think they're at 10 to 14 weeks right now. And if I tell you 10 to 14 weeks or 12 to 14 weeks, assume you're at the 14 weeks. Uh, California Analytical, again, about 12 to 14 weeks for their uh, total hydrocarbons and NOx boxes. Uh, ABB AO 2000s are extended. They come out of Germany. So if you're into a division two SEMS world and you're using an ABB, you can you can expect those deliveries to be uh, probably at least 16 weeks, which is about double what they normally were pre COVID. Sample lines haven't been affected that much. We're still at eight to 10, maybe 12 week delivery for sample lines, which was pretty typical um, pre COVID. Um, although they're subject to change very quickly because they, if they run out of Teflon or they run out of tubing, um, you could have real delays there. Rack components, not a big deal. You can still get racks on a regular basis um, in you know two to six weeks. And uh, data loggers, uh, the ESC data loggers, um, you know they're running about eight weeks, uh, but just a data logger isn't going to do your your DAS project. You need the project management and the rest of that. And so that that runs to between 14 and 16 weeks to, to employ all of that. Sample system components are somewhere that integrators are getting really getting, you know, uh, devastated with when it comes to deliveries. 
Um, stainless steel components, not too much. Even the coated ones, silco or sulfonate type coatings, those are coming in a few weeks longer than normal. Um, exotics like Monel and Hastelloy, crazy. Um, I actually put this up here. I don't know if you can see it. This was a quote we got, a, I think, a week or two ago from Swage Lock. And you'll, if you go through this, if you can see it, you'll see four weeks for this component, four days for this component, two weeks for that component. And then, whoops, here's a female, uh, uh, a female branch tea, Hastelloy, 42 weeks. Now, if I'm building a sample system, I need that Hastelloy T in there. What do I do? I, I, I can build everything but that that T. So these are the kind of things that you get as a curveball when you're ready to buy the components. You update your quote and something you need for your subassembly is out almost a year. Uh, and there are Hastelloy components that are 52 weeks. We're doing a job right now for Dow and we're being told by um, by swage lock that some components we need are 52 week delivery. And, you know, the project just can't wait that long. Shelters, 12 to 16 weeks, but remember that's after you approve their drawings. So that's after receipt of approval drawings. HVACs have been well extended. Uh, Division two HVACs are nominally uh, 18 to 20 weeks to get. And, uh, Nice thing about an AC is you can put it on the shelter towards the end of the project, but it's still a very long lead delivery. Sample lines, as I said before, haven't changed much. PLCs are interesting. We're getting the microprocessors in four weeks, but some of the cards we need for them are out 20 weeks. So the IO cards that we need to wire the PLC into the subassembly, some of them we can't get for, for 20 weeks. And that's really extending uh, we, we need the PLCs in the projects pretty quickly so that we can wire everything to them. And so that's really caused some heartache on our end. Uh, ESCs, as I said, their, their data controllers for their DASs are, are pretty good lead time still. So those are your delivery issues. If that wasn't bad enough, what's happening now in pricing is unprecedented. I've been in this business 35 years. I've never seen anything like it. We're seeing prices change weekly. In some cases, we've seen component prices for exotic materials double in four and five weeks. Um, analytical equipment has been hit with, finally hit with inflation. Uh, the Churchill Company, which is a parent company to, well, now us, NESC and TSI and some others, uh, they've got an analytical group that looks at things like this. And they're saying expect inflation to be in the high single digits through this year and to probably um, stay that way until maybe Q4 next year. The national average for inflation right now is 7.7%. I, I expect inflation to run in our market closer to 10% and maybe higher for certain components. Um, we're getting bids right now from vendors that, will, that are no longer than 30 days. They will not extend bids beyond 30 days. We've gotten bids from HVAC manufacturers with three days validity on them. I don't know what they think we can do with their bid in three days. We are going to estimate the project, get the award. You saw the timeline. Go through an, an approval phase, order the gear. That's two months later. So uh, a three-day bid is, is um, not a lot of use to us. Just to kind of show you what's happening in our world, this is the core consumer price um, CPI type indices uh, for all products in the U.S. And you can see the steady rise. That's what it looks like, the pr producer price index. That's what it looks like for analytical equipment, um, laboratory and instrument manufacturing. So something's gone on in our industry that has taken prices through the roof very recently. And we see it um, as an integrator um, like I said, really in the last two months, we've seen massive price increases for certain components. So how do you handle this? You know, how do you speed up your project? Um, how do you make your project run more efficiently? Well, first thing I would recommend is when you do a project, remember it's a two-way street. It's not just the integrator flowing information to you. You have to flow information back. You have to communicate extensively 
with your system integrator and with your manufacturers, either directly or through your system in integrator. Nothing's more important than getting your budget set early. Um, early implementation of projects saves money. It saves money in normal environments. In, a, in an environment where we have this kind of inflation, it's huge. Have your spec ready, your RFQ information ready. What do I mean by that? Well, first and foremost, focus, it, focus your specification. We get specifications from end users that has massive amounts of boilerplate in it, and frequently it's not needed. There's, there's massive amounts of piping information that has nothing to do with the analytical system we're supplying, has everything to do with the process units, and they lump all this together, and it takes time when you're bidding a job and when you're engineering a job to make sure that you're reading everything that might apply. If you can focus that spec, it saves a lot of time and it saves some money. Have your stream compositions and um, the information you need for the integrator to size things properly, to do his, his uh, or her engineering or her instrument engineering to know how they're going to build the sample system. If it's a compliance applications, get us the permit early. We need to look at that very early in the process so we aren't making changes in the middle of the project. Be flexible with your terms and conditions. And this is a tough one because there's some attorney on both ends of the, the project, but um, we get a lot of terms and conditions. Again, um, we'll be handed a terms and conditions that is the same T's and C's for the people who built the plant in the first place or are doing the flare and the flare recovery system. And meanwhile, we're doing a very small piece of it that's analytical. So be flexible on your T's and C's. Be flexible right now with your delivery, liquidated damages and things like that because um, integrators just can't accept really difficult liquidated damages uh, because of the environment that they're in right now. That CYA approach that will get taken if they have to uh, bid to specifications that aren't clear or bid to potential liabilities uh, that CYA costs money, and um, and you don't want to go there if you if you don't have to. Um, if you can work with a system integrator who has experience in your specific monitoring system, I highly recommend you do that. Um, check that their engineering and their fabrication uh, facilities, their people have the bandwidth to do your project. Uh, visit the integrator look at the schedule, make sure they can handle your project for you award a contract. Um, if you can conform the design of your project into something they've already done, you can shorten a lot of the engineering and potentially procurement phase and be surprised how much money you can save on engineering. And, um, and you know, if you, if you lean into something they've already done. During the approval phase, uh, there are opportunities to get things on order very quickly. For instance, if I start a project today, my engineers begin a drawing approval phase. Well, limit your approvals to the things you really need up front. You need weights, you need dimensions, you need customer connection diagrams, you need to know uh, your, your load list, you need to know what your wiring analog, what your network connections are going to look like, because those are the things you hand to your construction folks and say, here's what's coming. You don't need every wire terminal for the interior of the shelter or how one safety monitor is wired to the PLC, but you need to know what alarms are you getting out. You need to know, am I getting that out in Modbus? Am I bringing fiber in? Where are my connection points for fiber? Where are my connection points for, for signal? Where are my connection points for the sample line and the, uh, the power and, and those things that you need up front. So get those done quickly and things like shelter shell layouts, get those approved, make your integrator give you those layouts first so they can get those shelter shells on order right away. Uh, don't change it on them later, but get those approvals right away because I need to get a shelter vendor. Give me a drawing where the door swings are, where the bulkheads are and where my power entries are going to be. And then once I approve that, they start constructing that shelter. So if the shelter is going to take 12 weeks from there, I've at least got that on order. Get your analytical equipment, get your ranges set, get that gear on order. HVACs, approve the, uh, approve the engineering on the HVAC, get those, let your 
integrate or get those items on order. If you're going to order them yourself, and I don't think that saves an awful lot of time, but it, it can if you know exactly what you want and you're going to order it and bring it to the integrator, get that done quickly too. Um, be flexible with your AMLs, your approved manufacturers list. There are going to be times when your integrator is going to come to you and say, uh, that, that Brooks Rotometer you want is 16 week delivery, but I can get a King in four. And uh, if King is not on your AML, you know, consider being flexible with that. Um, lean into those or equal components that you see in specs. Um, hold frequent progress meetings with your, with your integrator and with manufacturers. Um, and you want to have the right stakeholders in those meetings. You don't need them in every meeting, but if you're going to talk about the network, make sure you're that you have your the right IT people on the call. What we find is if we're asking questions as an integrator about how you want to do things, and then those emails get sent to that department, that department has to answer and come back. It takes forever sometimes to get answers. But if you get those stakeholders in the meeting and ask those questions, you can frequently resolve the questions right then and there. So we recommend weekly meetings, well-planned, so that you can get this, the right stakeholders at the meetings um, where you're going to discuss relevant topics. Um, monitor progress with the system integrators. Um, how do you do that? Well, ask them for photos of how the construction's going. It's part of those weekly meetings. Know what the schedule is for sub-assemblies. In other words, if I tell you that we are going to build your PLC and place it in the shelter at a, on a certain date, um, I should be able to produce for you a shortage report a week before the PLC construction that you can look at and say, well, you still don't have these cards. How are you going to go into production? So ask for shortage reports. If your integrator's organized, has an ERP, uh, he can probably produce things like that for you. And I guess what I'm asking you to do as an end user is keep your system integrators honest when it comes to the schedule. And a good integrator will have no problem being uh, transparent in those sorts of things. Um, we do a lot of virtual FATs these days and they work really well. And sometimes you can delay a project two or three weeks to get the right people to your facility to do the factory acceptance test. Well, consider doing virtual FATs. We've been having great success with that. Uh, COVID forced it on us, but I, I think they're here to stay. And then there's those late items. There's those branch T's that take 42 weeks or maybe some other component that did not come in in time, consider allowing your integrator to put that in the field, to install that after the system's been shipped, obviously prior to startup, but have some flexibility there. Otherwise, the system's gonna sit on the shop floor until that component comes in. Now, these are highly specific, have to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but, but consider it and, uh, and be willing to pay for that mobilization because um, an integrator doesn't want to do that, but if it means keeping your project on track, uh, that might be something you would consider doing. Um, make sure your installation contractors are all lined up early. Make sure your um, any services you're bringing in from your system integrator, from manufacturers, for startup, RATA contractors, make sure you line that up early. Um, make sure you even line up maybe more time than you need. What we've been doing with clients is uh, telling them, listen, book us for longer periods of time because we want to make sure that we're there and we'll only bill you for what we use. But um, you've, you've got to be prepared to have, uh, to have your people on site longer to help you get these installations done. So I'm going to turn it back over to Eric to talk about what happens if your projects maybe don't finish in time and uh, what options do you have uh, in terms of extensions and, and other regulatory issues. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting stuff, how all this stuff is changing so quickly. In fact, what Greg talked about was kind of, okay, I have a new project, but also let's think of it from a spare parts list. You have current systems out there right now. You have a regulatory option to identify critical spare parts to minimize downtime of environmental compliance monitors. That's dependent on two things. It's dependent on what's the frequency of something breaking. So you under, understand 
Is it something that I'm obligated to have on site so I can re replace and repair because it's likely hood to fail is high, but it's also how quickly can I get it? If there, if you were depending on these things are readily available and I can get one tomorrow and that's not tomorrow, that's not the same, maybe your spare parts list is changing. Maybe you have to go back and revisit that and say, I've got to start stocking more or getting some things on order right now because the delay is longer than what it used to be. And now I will not be able to minimize downtime and my risk, if you will, has, has changed. So it's really interesting and it's ever changing. So, you know, what, so if we're looking at like, if we're looking at flare monitoring, because that's kind of the, the one that I think a lot of people are focusing on and it comes out of, you know, 40 CFR part 63, max CC, which has extension provisions in the general provisions of, of part 63. What are your options? Okay. EPA put built in extension, uh, uh, you know, requests and extension approvals inside of the general provisions. Now, if you are installing control device, it's easy, right? You basically can submit a, a extension request. And if you are uh, installing control devices, EPA will give you that, that one year or the state agency will authorize a up to a one year extension. So that's very clear in the role, but it's the control device aspect that we don't have here. Through the changes and through the, it came out of the boiler Mac, there was a lot of discussions around what about these other compliance measures, right? So that's where we need to lean on with respect to getting approval for an extension. We've got to actually look at these other compliance measures, and this is where it gets into the uh, the uh, the monitoring because it it actually describes monitoring systems as part of these other compliance measures. So what do we need to do? Is we need to take a good faith effort. Well, very sub very subjective, but one thing that is clear: it can't be because improper planning. So all the stuff that Greg mentioned has got to be. Not just it's not just a real nice, neat little letter to e to EPA and the state agency. You have to you have to justify support it. So it's something that they challenge and they push back. Show me certain things. Let me see the milestone dates. What have you done to date? What's in the way? So they're not necessarily just jumping and saying, "Yeah, sure, no problem." They're they're really going through and 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 evaluating. You know, what did you take, and is it something that's outside of your control? So good faith effort, right? They talk about these circumstances uh, or events that of not, are not of your own making. And they listed some of those work stoppages. Well, that could be the case with respect to certain COVID, you know, related, you know, uh, issues, uh, the shortage in skilled labor, that as well, and shortages of available technology. So they necessarily weren't envisioning supply chains, but they, but they were actually, uh, uh, you know, looking at certain technology that maybe if everyone goes get tries to get it, that it's it, it creates the you know the supply problem, right? But in this case, now we have a supply problem for other reasons, and and it's more upstream or downstream of the uh, or upstream of the uh, the analyzer equipment. And then also the actions, right? So you have to document certain things. What are you doing? Well, here's our plan. This is what we wanted to execute on, and here's the things that are in the way. Purchase orders. There's no better, you know, uh, uh, you know, way to go to the agency and say, hey, we tried, we ordered purchase, or purchase orders and we still can't get the material. They may ask and most likely they will ask, did you, did you issue a PO? That means that you're taking that good faith, faith effort of those next steps. And then talk with them, do early notifications. There's a 120 day requirement. Uh, from notification for extension request, but that's for that control device. They allow you to do the uh, the notification a little bit longer in the process up until the compliance date, but you just don't want to spring it on. I mean, if you're having problems, let them know. Here's what our plan is. That shows that good faith effort and that proactiveness of what you're trying to do. Now, the process for the compliance extension is they go to uh, the delegated authority. They have authorization to allow up to these one year, uh, you know, extensions and US EPA. There's going to be a, a cohesive, you know, discussion between EPA and uh, uh, the delegated authority just because they want to make sure that, uh, you know, states are, are looking at this equally, right? Uh, and the, the process for going is that, like I said, that initial communication on status. The first time that you send something in is not the first time they should know that you need an extension. 
You need to reach out and say, hey, we're running up against. We think we can do it, but let's look through and say we can't. What are what uh, do you need from us to go ahead and get this extension approved? What you will do is you will find they telling you exactly what they need. We need you to justify this to us. That allows that first extension request to go in in a manner in which you're, you're, you're checking all the boxes for them because they might, they, they, they might sympathize or empathize and they want you to get that extension, but they need to prove it to somebody else and they need to be held accountable from a public perspective as well as their oversight agencies. So give them what they need and you find that out by talking to them and saying, hey, here's what we think we're going to be. Contents of that report, that good faith effort. Right. That amen. We are all good faith effort. We tried. We tried. We tried. We just couldn't get it done. Justification of that and justification of that in their eyes. And then where, where do you, when do you, how long do you think it'll take? Be prepared to ask that question um, or answer that question, as well as I probably wouldn't, you know, put your schedule into your extension request only because that kind of locks you into things and you may have to continually to communicate. But don't be surprised if they ask for milestones. Tell me when and because don't just assume you're going to get the year. They may say you got six months, right? So you t let them make sure that you're getting yourself enough time that you need that you can support because they're not necessarily just going to be a writing a blank check on the timeline. You may see partial uh, approvals as well. So not just, hey, here's the compliance date for the ethylene Mac. Just everything is you know extended they may say nope you'd be in compliance with this because that's not it shouldn't be affected by your supply chain but for things like flare monitoring that you have some issues you know installing and purchasing equipment then that can be extended so partial extensions were something we saw in the refining sector so there's a whole process that element if you think you're going to use it needs to start happening uh and at least reaching out to the agency even if you don't know if you're going to need it it doesn't hurt to have that conversation let's them know you're thinking of it you're you're planning for it you're doing what you can right now uh and then you're also getting an idea of like and also you may get an idea of what, what other people are doing because the agency usually say yes because we are we're hearing a lot of that lately we're seeing a lot of facilities approaching us with these extension requests and they want to you know we kind of provide a consistent uh, uh, approach to them. So with that, we wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions, and I think we Okay, perfect. So we got seven minutes, right? Yep. Um, so with that, I guess, uh, or myself or, or Greg, uh, 